execution, I would say. Just returning to our example, Tom Fernandez, the, the British man who got hit with a bill for 19,000 euros. That's mm -hmm. that's extraordinary. I mean, is that, is that unusual, or, or do you often get cases like that? Many foreigners do not understand why they have to pay or even declare their domination when they move to Germany, and therefore they not do so because they un don't understand. What happens usually, or what I know, is that if someone has not paid church tax, this is normally not noticed until they go to a church and want to get any services, like get married or become the godparents. So I don't really understand in the example how the um, church tax office noticed that he was baptized but didn't declare his denomination when he moved to Germany. Usually in such cases, the church does not demand backdated payments. However, I cannot say with certainty that this is the case in all dioceses and especially not in all churches. Anna Hopp talking to me earlier. And last week we broadcast a discussion inspired by Rowan Williams's damning verdict on the hymns many people choose for their weddings. The former Archbishop of Canterbury compared them to baby food. Some of the songs we have at song ceremonies these days just don't stretch people. They assume that people are still in their primary school mode of thinking and feeling. And that's what worried me a bit, that we're not giving people enough solid nourishment that stretches them and takes them into a rather bigger world than they inhabited before. I will ask for your reaction to those comments and lead to our discussion. And you obliged with some forthright views. Hello. It's Ruth Edwards from Redford, Nottinghamshire. I was really offended and really object to Rowan Williams's attitude to popular hymns being the same weddings. I strongly suggest you have a reality check. I feel christenings and weddings and funerals that the prime occasions when families and friends and acquaintances come together, I feel singing a well-known hymn together surely strengthens that bond, especially if you know when the a dear love person Have you ever heard a congregation disjointedly trying to sing new tunes or new words? I certainly have, and it's awful. And by the way, I had the hymn one more step along the way, I go. Because it was a joyous reflection of my parents' lives. They were good people and they lived their Christian faith. And they have no need or wish to preach it because their actions showed it in space. Hello, I'm Sarah Rogers and I live in the Wanda in South Wales. I live in the land of Son. I love to sing and I love a good hymn. I agree with Rowan Williams that hymns at weddings are baby food. I'm not sure what we do about it. Church weddings these days are largely for the unchurched. And as a vicar, I do my best to engage with couples and congregations at weddings. But I'm finding it is increasingly difficult to persuade couples to include hymns at all. I have a wedding next week with no hymns. The couple don't really know any and don't think the congregation will sing. I don't have an organist, and all too often I end up leading the singing at the front of the congregation, listening to the sound track. I'm afraid I rely on songs people remember from school, or indeed from the Rugby Stadium, from Rhonda and Time Bar, to get them to singing. But even that is declining. Difficult state of affairs. and I'm a licensed lay minister at St. Lucas Church in Standish. Last week's program really made me think about things for funerals and how we choose them. And to me, a funeral is the chance for family to say their farewell to someone they have loved in the presence of God. And I believe hymns can really help us to do that well. To do that, they need to have meaning for the person in their family. And it could be a childhood difficult, or maybe something sung at a wedding. It can fit with what the person loved them know. So a love of the countryside and garden fits with all things bright and beautiful. 
It's not least because, I don't know the average age of saints, um, but he was incredibly young to have made such an impression. Yes, I mean, he's not the only young saint. Um, I'm the youngest saint from very young, but most saints obviously are, are adults and much older. And, and what was it about his short life that so impressed the Vatican? Well, he had a great faith, he had a great love of the Eucharist, um, he um, he had a big heart for everybody, he did a lot of volunteering, um, helped people at school who were in trouble. Um, he also made a uh, website, uh, when he was 14 he started doing it, uh, of all the Eucharistic miracles around the world. He documented them and made a website and a travelling presentation that's still going um, today. I mean, I, I tried to claim him for Britain, <laughs> that's a rather clumsy way, but he was Italian and he, he grew up um, in, uh, in Italy. Um, as I understand it, he made a big difference to his parents' life as well as many other people, because they, they were not especially, well, they're born Catholic, so they, they weren't especially religious. No, they didn't go to church um, at all, and um, uh, little Carlo, he was just always uh, had such a close relationship with God and such an interest, he was always asking questions, he didn't want to go past the church without um, going in to say hello to Jesus, and um, all his questions and his example just uh, drew his mother back to the faith first, and then uh, his father. And he was buried at the CC, well he's well, not buried actually, because there's a shrine to him now at the CC where you could still see his body, it's just it's, it's funny that it's just it's, um, yes, yes, there's a live stream of his tomb um, because he's um, at least partially incorrupt or, you know, it's not quite clear yet whether he's fully incorrupt and um, the tomb is open with a glass panel on the side and he's lying there in his um, in trainers and his um, modern clothing and uh, everyone can go and pray there and you can actually visit on the live stream as well. Well, as I say, this is Rodney, so tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write? I know your book is a fictionalised biography, but what, what was it about the story that inspired you to write a book about it? It, it was exactly what you started off with, actually, the fact that he's a, a young, modern saint, um, and I was quite a lot of buzz about him going around before his um, beatification in 2020, and then someone said to me, oh, why didn't you write about him? And I said, oh, I haven't got time. But then the idea just kind of lodged, lodged in me, and the Holy Spirit was kind of working and so eventually I, I wrote the story. And as I said right at the beginning, this the fact that I recognised a second miracle attributed to him. Can you just remind us what it what it was? Yes, the second miracle, um, a Costa Rican woman, um Valeria I think, and she fell off her bike, she had a brain hemorrhage and the doctors gave her a very low chance of survival. And her mother prayed for the intercession specifically of Paulo Acutis and visited his tomb. And on the very same day, she began to breathe independently, and the very next day she was able to walk, um, and all the evidence said that the hemorrhage had just disappeared. 
And, and to what extent do you think that the, the Vatican is trying to send a... a I'm sure they, they would say that they were, they were planning to canonise him for his virtue, but are they trying to send some kind of a signal to a young... I mean, I'm sure it's, it's certainly a protective uh, when, when they get a young saint. Um, but... You know, he's going to be canonised because he's a saint. Um, but yeah, I'm sure everyone's very excited that there is this young, this very young saint, uh, first saint of the millennium. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you find that young people are attracted to him and intrigued by his story? Yeah, but I think so. As I say, um, when they were trying to talk about beatifying him, which is the stage before canonisation, there was starting to be quite a buzz on the internet and social media. Um, I think the fact that he was a computer geek, as, as they say, um, also made him quite um, approachable to young people. Karen Turner, thank you very much um, indeed for that. The time is approaching 27 minutes to 8. You're listening to Sunday. Still coming to the programme, the drama and religion of the last Caravaggio. We're inviting you to step into the scene. We've got this intense darkness in the background and the figures cast in that typical Chiara score, that use of light and darkness that Caravaggio is so famous for by this period. Now, were it not for the general election announcement, the last week would probably be remembered for two big public inquiries into the failures of our institutions, the infected blood inquiry and the post office inquiry. We should also by now have the results of a Church of England inquiry into the violent abuse committed by John Smy, the lawyer involved in the running of evangelical Christian holiday camps who died in 2018. In January, after several delays, the CV said the Smy inquiry's report would be published last month, but it wasn't. Why not? I spoke earlier to one of John Smythe's victims, he's known as Graham, and he told me what happened to him. In the late 70s, a prominent QC, John Smythe, used his influence at the Christian Ewan camps to persuade young men, myself included, to get involved in the most horrific test of our faith. Uh, we were challenged how far he prepared to go, how serious are you in your belief in Christ? And he then inflicted the most appalling beatings, drawing blood. A contemporaneous report suggested he inflicted 14,000 strokes of the cane, and I was one of his victims. And you subsequently gave evidence to the inquiry into the events surrounding that. What did you tell them? My story is more involved than some others because I am the victim that came forward in 2012 to the Church of England to disclose the abuse. And I gave them a full testimony over that period, that 12-year period, where we have been waiting for the truth to come out to understand why my disclosure in 2012 failed to find and then stop John Smythe, and uh, why no one over that period has been brought to justice. Do you feel that the inquiry made any progress at all in answering some of those questions? I watch with a sense of foreboding the deja vu, the post office, infected blood, Grenfell, and these inquiries seem to drag on forever without constant pushing from victims, Alan Bates saying post office case. I'm not sure some of these reviews would happen. I have read the review of the confidentiality agreement, and it is not what I would expect after nearly five years of work. There's testimony missing, gaps in the story, and I describe it as being a for purpose. And you've actually withdrawn your evidence, haven't you? Which I think is one of the reasons it's been delayed yet again. Well, I am being blamed for the purpose of that. That's just to make in 10 weeks to withdraw my efforts. I'm not quite sure why it took him so long. But yes, to be honest, I want nothing more to do. And when you say that there are gaps in evidence and so forth, do you, you feel it simply doesn't present what you read in the earlier draft? Doesn't present a true account of what happened? One of the largest gaps is the fact that Smythe's worst abuse in Africa, over 90 victims were part of a lawsuit, which ended in the death of Guy Neoturu and 
Mr. Smythe has been charged with culpable homicide, has been excluded from the terms of reference of the Macon Review. He was exiled to Zimbabwe with the knowledge of a whole host of senior Church of England clerics, and he just set up camps and started again and was beating boys as young as 11. We are just baffled by why the Church of England doesn't think that should be part of the investigation. And he died in 2018. The review began in 2019. We're now, as you say, five years in. Do you have any understanding of why it has taken quite so long, apart from anything else? Do you know, it's the 14th announced delay, the one 10 days ago. They've delayed it 14 times now. It was under-resourced to start with. We victims pointed out it involved over 100 victims over four decades in three countries. And Mr. Macon was contracted for two days a week. It never had the GDPR recording prescribing functions that a competent review would have. I hesitate to call Mr. Macon grossly incompetent, but any review that takes four years longer than it's meant to, you have to ask why. And when do you now expect to see the results, do you think? Well, Ed, in January 22, it was announced that it would be published by April 22. Either there was just an outright lie, or they were incompetent in their understanding of how much more work would be needed. So as we sit here now in May, do I think it'll be out this year? I think it might be, but I've learned not to believe the word they say. Well, on that point, do you mind if I just put to you what the Church of England has said um, to us about this issue? I'll read it at length because it's all important, I suppose. As, as commissioners of the review, the National Safeguarding Team recognises the process has gone on longer than is acceptable for those waiting for an outcome, particularly the victims and survivors of the horrendous abuse by John Smythe. We continue to apologise for this delay and offer support through an independent advocacy service. The church also needs to act and learn on the outcomes of the report when it's finally published. We have continued to offer additional resources and financial support to the reviewer to ensure the report is ready for publication as soon as practically possible after the current representation phase has concluded. Does that make any sense to you? It's all words, Ed. They announced in January that they'll be out in April. They've actually, cleverly or wisely this time, not put a publication date in the most recent announcements. I have no idea when they'll be out. Can I finally ask you what this is doing to you? Because you, you must have a feeling that the whole dreadful saga is still hanging over you in some way um, until the report actually those things pronounced. Ed, in the Smythe story, there have been two deaths, two suicide attempts, two mental health sections and four divorces since I came forward. Until this is published, we have no idea what went wrong in 2013, we have no closure, and we have no justice. And as I said earlier, I'm referring to the post office otherwise, these processes take forever. I cannot move on, I cannot put this behind me till I know what happened. Thanks, Graham, for talking to me earlier. We did, I should say, invite Keith Making, the independent reviewer, to come on the programme, but he declined our invitation until the publication of his report. The Last Caravaggio was the title of an unusual exhibition at the Shelley International Gallery in London. Unusual partly because the exhibition is displayed in the Academy of Darkness, and partly because it's really just a second the one absolutely stellar picture, the martyrdom of Sedersa. I'm at the National Gallery and I'm with Siobhan Jolly, who's a fellow in art and religion here. And before we go in and see the exhibition, I just want to pause for a moment, because I suspect many of our listeners won't know about Sedersa and her martyrdom. Can you tell us a bit about her and what happened to her? So Ursula is someone who had a very, very popular hagiography in the Middle Ages. And we see a lot in Renaissance art that reflects this. So the story is that she is a British or Breton princess who did not wish to marry the, the leader of the Huns. And so she was given permission to go on pilgrimage before her marriage. And so she traveled with maybe 10 virgins, maybe 11 virgins, maybe 11,000 virgins, depending on the, the version of the text that you read. And when they were in Cologne, they encountered the Huns and ultimately she decided that she still did not wish to marry and she was killed alongside the 10, 11, 11,000 virgins 
but she's fallen really from our contemporary discourse around saint and that's partly because she was uh, downgraded from a full saint observation in the catholic church and as i understand it at the time that this great painting was painted. The tradition in religious art was to depict this scene as kind of mass slaughter, huge panoramic pictures. Exactly. Imagine if you're a Renaissance artist and you've got a story which potentially has 11,001 characters being killed. You can imagine the, the drama that you want to have into that scene. And of course, Caravaggio flips that on his head. Well, let's go and see what he did with it. And we are stepping into complete darkness, or almost complete darkness. This is so different from the exhibitions where you come to quite a bit of lots of pictures all over the walls, but this has got only really two pictures and bits of information around the place. And such drama is the scene of Los Angeles. And it's what kind of I do is best. And so the exhibition's called The Last Carol by Joe. This is the last work that we know to be painted by him. And I think we really see him compositionally. It's seen just incredible drama, and particularly the darkness, it immediately makes you look at it. We're really drawn into this moment. So he's painted for us these half-length figures, and we're invited really to step into the scene with this intense darkness in the background, and the figures cast in that typical Chiara story, that use of light and darkness that Caravaggio is so famous for by this group. And it, it just gives us the Baroque drama that we've come to know and expect from him, but also with a degree of poignancy, knowing that this is a work which contains his self-portrait and also is his last known work. Well, before we talk about his, his part in it, let's just describe the scene, because in sort of, as you say, almost tight close-up, you've got the Hunnish chief who's literally just fired the arrow which kills Ursula, and she's looking down at the, at the shaft that's deep in her chest, and at that moment she knows she knows she's going to die, but presumably she also knows or believes that she's a uh, martyr's crown, she's going to One of the things that's really beautiful about this composition is that very human element that we see in the face of the woman, almost a, a moment of regret, shock, he inspired that idea, incredibly good for using the face to face with this. The huge act of violence is just kind of good, and we, we see the aftermath of that in his reaction. And quite an eerie calm in the first one. You know, Caravaggio's really evokes that sense of death that is upon him, and then that speaks of the, the tradition of the market where death is to be avoided, but ultimately, what's written with uh, Shiva here is someone who has made her choice and stands by it. And as you say, Caravaggio himself watching in the background, having, I think I'm right of saying, I've himself been through a moment of extreme violence not long before painting the picture, he'd been hideously disfigured in a brawl outside a pub. Yeah, so Caravaggio is someone whose life is marked by these episodes of violence and it's, it's less usual that he's the victim. We know very little about it, but we know that he was still recovering from that in the time when he was painting his work. But obviously what's interesting here is that his face is not this big. And what does the picture tell us you think about its understanding of Catholicism? So I think people often worry about Caravaggio as the bad boy of art and think of him as a rebellious character, which he obviously is in his personal work. We know that during the time he's painting his work, he's returning to his the capital of Alex and Michael, he's trying to get a pardon, having killed a man. But he's painting it into this moment of the Italian Baroque, this moment of kind of drama, and there's something about him that really gets it. And so most of his commissions, most of his known works, for religious patrons or for churches, and he really captures this interest that the Catholic Church has after the Council Reformation of bringing this personal moment of intensity and encounter into their religious artworks, and he does that, I think, better than anybody. What for you is so special about this picture? I think there's obviously a sentimentality to it being the last Caravaggio, and this was a work that he painted for a known patron in Genoa, and so the it's very unlikely that they would have requested that self-portrait, but the decision to write himself into this moment, I think, is very interesting. And we can see it in the 
the Duke of Salome that's also in the room that Caravaggio is someone who, without wanting to know the biographer, has known violence in his life and he has been both the Khan and he's been the executor of incredible violence and he's been the victim of incredible violence and position himself as the witness here, as the onlooker, as the, the character that knows both moments, the character that engages us as the viewer, I think is really powerful. At the National Gallery on the last Caravaggio. On the 15th of May, the Christian think tank Theos published research on religion and voting patterns. Attack it on the data, which is now called the general election. Pope Theos must have been singing Hosannas of thanks for the serendipitous piece of prime ministerial PR. We assess their conclusions and indeed the significance of the religious vote more generally. We're joined by to mix religious members, the Pope of Election, the Religious John Curtis, Professor of Politics at Strathclyde University. Good morning. Good morning, Edward. Can I make it absolutely clear that I'm not in fact? <laughs> well, we'll bear that in mind um, in, the course of, in the course of this interview. Uh, one of the conclusions is that Christians uh, are generally more likely to vote um, than other people. Does that make sense to you? And why do you think it might be? Well, I, it's, they're not the first uh, piece of research to identify that those who uh, attend a religious service regularly um, are more likely to uh, turn out at the polling station. Uh, that is probably part of a broader pattern whereby people who are engaged in any kind of community organisation, whether it's their local bowling club or their local church or uh, whatever, um, uh, are more likely also then to be perhaps uh, engaged in uh, politics. That said, uh, as the research itself acknowledges, the pattern is not entirely straightforward. Um, I, I've uh, gone back and checked indeed from what, how people actually vote. This was based on how people would be likely to vote. It's, it's particularly a phenomenon amongst Anglicans. It's regular Anglicans who are particularly likely to turn out and vote. And as the research itself, it says, you know, when, when we're looking at the Muslim community, uh, actually this pattern doesn't uh, identify itself at all, which does therefore suggest it isn't just a question of community engagement, but it's also something in particular about um, how the, those people who uh, attend the uh, uh, and go to regularly, though of course these are now relatively rare proportion of our society. Talk about the Muslims in a moment or two, but just sticking with the, the Anglicans, Christians more generally, uh, what about the way they tend to vote? Well, one of the claims that the um, research makes is that um, the link between Catholicism and the Labour Party uh, has disappeared. I think, to be honest, I've been checked with a slightly overrated footage. Uh, the first thing to, to, to say is that in, in terms of voting behaviour, um, in some respects the more obvious division is between those who are, do not identify with any religion and those who do. Those who do not identify with religion tend to be less likely to vote conservative, somewhat more likely to vote Labour than our general population. Amongst those who do identify with religious, um, well, first of all, the Muslim community, surprise, surprise, are those who are most likely to vote for the Labour Party. But Catholics, in being as likely as the general population to vote Labour, are very different from those who are Anglican or indeed uh, associated with any other Protestant denomination. So I think to that extent, at least, uh, while the connection between Catholicism and the Labour Party may not have been as strong as it once was, the truth is the relationship between religion and uh, uh, politics is much more in general than it was back in the 19th century. Um, I think that there is still strong clear evidence that the uh, Labour Party is relatively speaking doing well amongst Catholics. So, so just with the Anglicans, I mean, the whole idea that the Church of England is the, is the Tory party of prayer doesn't really stack up. Well, uh, it, it isn't in the sense that because most conservatives don't go to church, but those who do go to church are disproportionately likely to be supporting conservatives. Now, in part, of course, that's a different age. Those who attend uh, the Christian church regularly, including the Church of England, are much more uh, age is the biggest division of division in our politics. Older people vote conservative, the younger people vote Labour, but it isn't just that it's much more to account for the church. So if you go to the church, you can job probably identify conservatives, but if you go to a conservative party, most of them will not be You mentioned the position that in the Muslim community, um, less likely to vote, um, as you say. We've talked a lot on the program about the impact of Gaza on the, uh, on the campaign, particularly on, on, on support of labor. How significant a factor do you think that will really be when the vote? 
quality confident? Well, I think in, certainly in terms of you know, issues associated with religion that are most likely to perhaps make some difference to how people vote, at least on this side of the Irish Sea, then um, the Gaza issue is almost undoubtedly likely to be it. You know, I, traditionally, as I've said, and if you look at previous elections, people from a Muslim background, along with many others, much more likely to vote Labour. But we saw in the last elections at the beginning of this month in places where both the large numbers of people identify as Muslim, Labour started falling back. That said, uh, most of the constituencies with both the large numbers of Muslims were safe even in 2019 when Labour were doing badly. So while we might well find at the beginning of July that the Labour Party does fall back in some of these constituencies, whether it will fall back enough, given Labour's broader uh, lead at that moment at the opinion polls, will fall back enough to cost Labour the seat. That, I think, is probably not less likely. And any other religious issues, like abortion, say, that you think might make a real difference for people are watching the parties closely? Well, for well, well, yeah, the, one, the one thing that all religions have in common, though, is particularly those who identify with the religion body and say the practice they tend to be more socially conservative. So when it comes to issues like whether or not people who are transgender should be able to change their birth certificate to recognize the gender they live in, as opposed to the one that they registered as poor, or more broadly the issue of equal opportunities, some of these issues which certainly set exceptions to the Conservative Party have been exercised in life and have been tried to, to suggest that perhaps have gone too far on. That, that is an area where most of all religions yeah. change, it's a big less favourable. Well, we must leave it there, strong Curtis. Well, it probably is in power, so we think this one is good <laughs> and broadcast it. That's it for this week's Sunday. We might Ahmed is in the chair next week. You can, of course, listen again or download the programme on the BBC Sands app. Um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Sunday was produced by Catherine Murray and James Leesley, the studio managers Kelly Young and Major Goodall. And now the founder of BRAC Foundation, Lauren Lefay. Lefay makes this week's Radio 4 appeal on behalf of the charity. No mother ever wants to start a charity in a child's name. But after losing my beloved son, Breck, I felt I had to. Breck was an everyday schoolboy, but of course, very special to me. Clever, confident, funny, sensible too. A boy who usually made good decisions. But what we learned hardest possible way is that no young person is safe from online harms. Like many teenage boys, Breck's biggest passion is computing and online gaming. Some school friends invite him to join the virtual gaming room, where they play games and chat through their headsets. But what I didn't initially know is that an outsider was running the group. He was an older teenager, and after months of virtual contact, Breck and his friends considered this dangerous predator a real friend. From the moment I heard that voice, how he said he was an undercover government agent living in New York, I had a gut feeling that something was wrong, that maybe he was grooming Breck. Then Breck's behavior and attitudes changed. He became isolated from his family and friends. I went to the police, who advised me to take away Breck's devices, which I did. But the groomer was manipulative and controlling, sending Breck a secret phone and driving the grooming underground. One day, he invited Breck around to his house. My beloved 14-year-old son left home for the last time that day. Breck's killer will spend at least 25 years in prison for his murder. Since then, the Breck Foundation has been teaching young people to recognize the first signs of online grooming. We visit schools across the UK to alert children, parents, and teachers to the dangers they may face online. I believe Breck would still be with me had he and his friends sat through a Breck Foundation talk. And that's why I ask for your help today to make the online world a safer place for all children through education and empowerment. 20 pounds means 10 children will hear information that may keep them safe from harm or even save their life. Anything will help, and a corporate sponsor has kindly pledged to match donations up to a total of £1,000. Just search online for BBC Radio 4 Appeal or call 0800 404 8144. That's 0800 404 8144. Or write
write a check to Breck Foundation and send it to Free Post, BBC, Radio 4 Appeal. That's the whole address, and please mark the back of the envelope with the words, Breck Foundation. Thank you. Well, I think the polls are free from landlines and, and mobiles, and you can find all the details for giving online. You can search for BBC Radio 4 Appeal. Remember, if you are a UK taxpayer, and if you want the Breck Foundation to collect the gift aid on your donation, please include an email or postal address so they can send you a gift aid declaration. Let's get a weather update. Here's Elizabeth Mazzini. Thanks, Neil. Well, plenty of sunshine yesterday, of course, but it's a very different day of weather today. And in fact, the theme of sunny spells and heavy thundery showers will continue for much of the rest of the bank holiday weekend as well. We've seen plenty of rain through the night. That's all been tracking northwards. So it's been a very soggy night, lots of saturated ground out there. And still for the northern half of the UK, for much of the rest of the day, that is Northern Ireland, North Wales, Northern England and Scotland, it's cloudy with spells of rain on and off, but the rain turning a bit more showery through the afternoon. Some of the showers heavy, the chance for a few brighter spells maybe. A few exceptions to that across northern areas of Scotland. I think we will see some bright and sunny spells through the morning, um, but then possibly a few showers as we go through the afternoon, but generally drier here. Towards the south, for much of the southern half of England and Wales, then it is a day of sunny spells and heavy thundery showers. It's brightening up as we speak, that rain tracking northwards. The early cloud breaking up, Watch out for the showers developing. There is the good chance of catching at least one, I think, today. They could be slow moving, particularly across northern England, the Midlands and East Wales. Some strong gusty winds within those showers. And they could last for some time with the generally light winds. So um, there could be some low flies that flood into very heavy downpours of rain. The southwesterly wind at Fort and most of us, temperatures get lower than yesterday's, generally 14 to 19 degrees for most, but maybe 20 degrees Celsius in southeast England. Overnight tonight it turns dry with clear spells in the south, further north still cloudy with spells of rain heavy at times for central and western Scotland. And more sunny spells tomorrow, but also scattering of showers. Well, thanks Elizabeth for seeing Well, uh, Paddy O'Connell joins us now to tell us about Broadcasting House at night. Paddy, good morning. Neil, hello. As you can see, I'm in the new BH election coverage mode.